In today's episode, we talk all about the bitter invention of Satan. You guessed it, caffeine. We go over absolutely everything that you would need to know about caffeine and talk about why it was even banned by the Pope for a period of time or how you're not allowed to use it in the Olympics. So make sure you subscribe, share this with a friend, and we'll catch you on the inside. We are going to dive right into this episode, and this is going to be all about caffeine. And we are going to talk about how to use caffeine to enhance your mental and physical health and performance, as well as the optimal dosages and timing for caffeine. We explain practical ways and uses of caffeine, the positive effects of caffeine on health, and how it impacts our sleep. And since caffeine is one of the most commonly used substances, more than 90% of adults use caffeine every single day. You are likely one of them. I know Alex and I definitely are two of them. So this episode is going to provide some great actionable tips and information for adjusting your caffeine consumption, as well as just for you to learn about caffeine altogether. Woo, let's get into it. So Alex, how would you define caffeine? Caffeine is a naturally occurring stimulant that belongs to a class of compounds called xanthins. It is an alkaloid, a type of organic compound that contains nitrogen and is found in many plants, including that beautiful bean, coffee bean, tea leaves, and cocoa beans. Caffeine is also produced synthetically, which you're going to find in energy drinks as well as your pre-workout and many other things, some foods as well, which is an interesting add-on that I don't think that I was aware of prior to uh, getting into the research for this, that there was caffeine in foods specifically. Anyway, there's also in supplementation as well as medications. The chemical structure of caffeine is quite simple, yet extremely powerful. It consists of three methyl groups attached to a nitrogen atom and two carbon atoms arranged in a ring structure. This structure allows caffeine to easily cross the blood-brain barrier, the thing that we so desperately need in the mornings, and affects the central nervous system as a whole. So from a definition perspective and speaking in definition terms, (laughs) that's going to be the outline for caffeine. But what is your preferred way of consuming caffeine for yourself? Coffee. And you know, fun fact, I've looked at because I have such a deep love of coffee, what type of coffee tattoo I would want. And I really can't nail it down quite yet because I don't want to go super basic and just like a mug of coffee on me. And so I've looked up like the chemical compound of caffeine to see if that would look cool. And it's all right. It looks pretty decent. Someone is likely not going to know what it is, but no one needs to know but myself, I guess. But coffee is really the only way I get caffeine on a day-to-day basis. Um, The only other type of other way I get caffeine in is if I do have a STEM pre-workout, but that is very seldom. My desired form of caffeine has changed over the years. I have been big on energy drinks through segments of my life. I've been big on coffee through segments of my life. I've been big on high dose pre-workout. All true. Different phases of my life. (laughs) In my current phase of life, I am very centered around coffee, enjoying my coffee in the morning and that really being my my only coffee or caffeine consumption throughout the day. Energy drinks will find their way in there. We all know that I do love my Alani new energy drinks, but for the most part right now, it is just coffee. So now that we know what caffeine is and where it's found, what does it look like for the amounts? Because with us talking about, let's say, coffee per se, what does it look like for the average amount of caffeine that you're getting in a cup of coffee? In an average cup of coffee, you're going to have 95 milligrams of caffeine. An average cup is eight ounces. And so when we look at tea, we have black tea, which is going to have 47 milligrams of caffeine. You have others such as white green tea that is going to have roughly half the amount of the black tea. So 25 milligrams, basically nothing. Yeah. Nothing in the grand scheme of things. Basically caffeine free. (laughs) (laughs) And then you're going to have very small amounts of caffeine in cacao or, or chocolate. So those are some of the ways that you can get some of the natural forms of caffeine. I thought that we probably have a handful of Starbucks customers, connoisseurs (laughs) 
that are listening to this, and I thought that giving some examples from Starbucks would be great for reference points. So a Venti Blonde Roast, the big old honkin' cup from Starbucks. The Venti Blonde Roast is 475 milligrams of caffeine. Sheesh. <laughs> Sheesh is right. Venti Cold Brew is 310 milligrams. Now, when I saw That's that, surprising. that was so surprising. I was surprised to see that the Venti Blonde Roast was 165 milligrams more than the cold brew. I thought the cold brew was going to be the tank. I bet the nitro. The is, nitro, it only goes up to the grande. they only let you sell it in the grande because it's that potent. Yeah, the grande was 280 milligrams. Okay. And then the grande Americano, which I feel like is probably... That's like our most commonly purchased when we're there. The Grande Americano is 225 milligrams of caffeine. So you're getting a hefty dose of caffeine when you're going to Starbucks, as many of you probably already knew, but maybe didn't know the extent of the quantity that you were taking. So when seeing this high of a number, and we're going to get into later of the proper dosage to get the benefits that we're going to speak on today come back to this as a reference point to understand maybe why you get extremely irritable when you don't get your caffeine, mm -hmm. maybe why you get a really hard crash from this quantity of caffeine, as well as potentially experience very high anxiety when consuming this quantity of caffeine. <laughs> I don't know if I would just be flat out offended if I looked up how much was in a red eye from Heine Brothers. That would probably be hurtful to find out because that used to be our drink of choice. That or the super large one from Dunkin' Donuts with an extra shot put into it. Well, I'm here to hurt your feelings because I already know the quantity <laughs> in that red eye. And for listeners, Heine Brothers is a great coffee spot in Louisville. A red eye, I honestly, do, off the top of my head, I'm not sure what makes that up. I want to say it's... I think it's a cup of coffee with the espresso in it. I want to say like a double shot of espresso. Maybe that's it. It was 425 milligrams Shh. of caffeine. It was a lot. Dang it. Yeah. Dang it. We, we are, and we'll talk about this as the episode continues, but we are former abusers of caffeine. We did abuse it big time. And <laughs> Which, I felt it. Yeah. <laughs> um, every part of my body felt how much I was abusing caffeine and not sleeping as well. Yeah. So you, that definitely catches up to you. We have gotten in a better place with it. And obviously, not obviously, but does give us an opportunity to teach on better practices yes. and ways that we've worked out of it. So the other form of caffeine is going to be from synthetic forms, right? So we have energy drinks, we have um, pre workout and, and so on. So I wanted to give a couple of common energy drinks to give you guys reference points. So that, that delicious Alani New Energy is going to be 200 milligrams per can. You have Bang Energy, which is going to be 300 milligrams per can. And then you have Rain, which is also 300 milligrams per can. Now with your pre-workouts, it's all going, it should be outlined on the back of the bottle or the yeah bottle. Mm -hmm. And those are going to range anywhere between 200 and 400 milligrams. I would imagine if it's exceeding 400 milligrams, I've seen pre-workouts do this. I would probably avoid it at all costs. That's going to be in extreme excess from what you are going to need to have the performance benefits that you're actually seeking from that pre-workout and what you're going to get from that 500 milligram uh, pre-workout is just being tweaked out and anxious. So yeah. nobody really needs and that. And all at once. That's a lot at once to have, as well as most of the time people I know that have caffeinated pre-workout, that's not the only caffeine they're having in the day. So if it is something that is that four to 500 milligrams, then that plus what other caffeine they're having, that's that's Quite a, a lot of caffeine. So now that we have some reference points of, of the quantity of caffeine, why don't you walk us through how this is going to work in the body? Caffeine actually works by blocking the adenosine receptors in the brain. And adenosine is a naturally occurring compound that actually builds up in your brain throughout the day and signals the body it's time to rest and sleep. And by blocking these receptors, caffeine prevents that feeling of drowsiness and promotes that wakefulness feeling overall. But over time, the brain responds to regular caffeine intake by producing more adenosine receptors, which can lead to tolerance and 
dependency. And this means that regular caffeine consumers may need more caffeine to achieve the same effects and may experience withdrawal symptoms when they stop consuming caffeine. And if you're wondering what does it mean to be a regular consumer of caffeine, this is going to be defined as someone, if you've ingested caffeine every day for the last two weeks, then you are a regular caffeine user. And if it's about two to four times per week, then you're going to be an intermittent user of caffeine. As that intermittent user, you're probably going to reap much greater benefit than the regular consumer because you're more unlikely to build or your brain is more unlikely to increase the amount of adenosine receptors. Thus, you're not building as strong of a tolerance. Thus, you're having the same quality of benefit, especially the person who's only having it maybe twice a week. Like you're really getting the most out of that caffeine consumption. And I am envious of you. <laughs> I wish I had that level of discipline. I don't care that level of discipline. I enjoy my coffee too much and I find benefit from it every day. Some days needing it more than others. Today is one of those days. <laughs> I was dragging a little bit out of well, bed Well, you this just morning. wanted to really be able to talk about caffeine, <laughs> yeah. having it running through your veins so you could feel close to it and really be able to vocalize what it's all about. Exactly. It was for science. It was for the podcast. It was for everyone listening. Exactly. I do have a, uh, a fun fact that I stumbled upon as I was doing the research for this. Um, did you know that caffeine was once banned by the Catholic Church? I did not know that. In the 16th century, way back yonder, <laughs> Pope Clement the Eighth was urged to declare coffee as the bitter invention of Satan. Satan. They do, he does so much. Because of its supposed ability to stimulate the mind and lead to sinful behavior. Mm, not wrong. <laughs> However, after tasting, after tasting coffee himself... He reportedly declared, this Satan's drink is so delicious <laughs> that it would be a pity to let the infidels have exclusive use of it. You know, I've always said Pope Clement was the smartest pope. Just heard about him today, but he's pretty wise. Now, did I fact check this little tidbit? No, I did not. I found it <laughs> on the internet. Is this true? Maybe. Could be. Everything else here is fact check. This fun fact, <laughs> this not fun fact, 100%. Not, not double checked. I found it somewhere, thought it was hilarious, and wanted to add that in here. And, you know, I love that he said that it was the bitter invention of Satan and then said, you know what? This is too good. Who even cares? <laughs> Why should we let the infidels have it? Exactly. Why should we do that? Satan, I mean, he makes some good stuff. Let's go ahead and enjoy it. He didn't even hold to his original stance whatsoever. As soon as he took the first sip, he said, let's all have it. Who cares? Now, let's dig into some of the things that Pope Clement was experiencing from a benefit perspective, because there's a <laughs> lot of benefits that Pope Benedict or whatever his name was, Clement, <laughs> Clement. <laughs> Pope Clement was experiencing. The The first one is improved cognitive function. Now, has, has this been something you experience with your of caffeine course. consumption? This is one of its most well-known benefits as a whole. Studies have shown that caffeine can improve memory, attention, reaction time, and overall mental performance. This is because caffeine stimulates the release of neurotransmitters such as dopamine, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine, which are all very important to overall cognitive function. Along with the cognitive function, uh, there's actually studies done on Alzheimer's and what caffeine plays a role there. And the Journal of Nutrition found that caffeine consumption improved cognitive function in participants who are sleep deprived. But that other study published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease found that caffeine consumption was associated with reduced risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, which I found extremely interesting to learn about. Very interesting. I think that when we talk about its benefits and just overall health benefits, there is a caveat that I feel like we should just constantly disclaim is that this is in a moderate dose. This is not a overconsumption or um, 
cro- like chronic overconsumption, if you will. Because I think that sometimes when individuals hear the benefit, it's like, I should just consume it all the time. I should have it all in my routine all the time. And that's just simply not the case. And we'll get into that here shortly. Now, alongside the cognitive function improvements, as well as some of those health benefits that we just talked about, we are also going to experience an upregulation in energy and overall alertness, which we've already touched on those adenosine receptors being blocked by caffeine, which is going to allow for us to be uh, more energetic and have greater overall alertness. Now, this is where we can really benefit from caffeine on maybe long drives, or we talk about sitting through longer meetings. I know that for myself, sitting in long meetings, I start to get about a little bit drowsy after about 30, 40 minutes sitting in the same spot. I need a little bit of a pick-me-up to stay focused in those different factors. So caffeine can be advantageous there, as well as in a scenario where maybe in a acute setting, you're having poor sleep and need a little bit of a pick-me-up to get you through the day and not drinking it into the evening, which we're going to talk about get you through the the challenging day with a little bit of hindered sleep as a whole. So having that energy increase as well as the alertness is a big benefit that I enjoy a whole lot. Yes. And I love that you mentioned with being sleep deprived that it can be helpful because it can be 100%. But again, that's where that asterisk comes in, where we want to know how we can utilize it. And it doesn't mean that every time that you're sleep deprived, that you should just turn to caffeine or caffeine is the magic answer. There's actually a study done. um, Researchers from MSU Sleep and Learning Lab um, went ahead and assessed how effective caffeine was in counteracting the negative effects of sleep deprivation on cognition. And as it turns out, caffeine can only get you so far. And so the study which was published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, um, assessed the impact of caffeine after a night of sleep deprivation. And more than 275 participants were asked to complete a simple attention task as well as a more challenging placekeeping task that required completion of tasks in a specific order without skipping or repeating steps. So they did a more simple task and then one that required more steps. And the study is the first to investigate the effects of caffeine on placekeeping after a period of sleep deprivation. So there definitely needs to be more studies done. But I love when I find like the first study on a certain subject. It's really cool to see where it starts and then where it's going to go as time goes on. And they found that sleep deprivation impaired performance on both types of tasks and that having caffeine helped people successfully achieve the easier task. However, it had little effect on performance of the placekeeping tasks for most participants. So caffeine may improve the ability to stay awake and attend to a task, but it doesn't do much to prevent the sort of procedural errors that can cause things like medical mistakes or car accidents. So it's there's not enough research on this to really come to a complete conclusion, but I did find it really interesting that they found that caffeine can increase energy, it can reduce sleeplessness, it can improve mood, but it does not replace a full night of sleep. And although people may feel like they can combat sleep deprivation with caffeine, their performance on higher level tasks specifically will likely still be impaired. So that's why it's really important to get your sleep in. And if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, how do I improve my sleep, Sue and Alex? We have some podcasts for you to be able to go over sleep and supplements for sleep. So we'll go ahead and have that linked in the show notes so you can check that out if you are possibly abusing or misusing caffeine and need to really focus on your sleep so you can get those harder tasks done. When I stumble upon research like that, I kind of kick myself from college version of Alex because oftentimes when I had big exams coming up, I'm cramming a bunch of studying in the night before and I'm staying up into the wee hours of the morning and then I'm just pounding caffeine the day of because I've got to replace the sleep that I didn't get the night before. And now as an adult, a much more educated adult, I realize that it would have just been better for me to get my quality of sleep and study planning, planning my studying earlier so I could have gotten that in. But Nevertheless, I do it now as an adult. So that's a win. <laughs> I don't do I don't do the the cramming for different things like that now. So that's a, a win as a whole. 
Yeah, I I love that you brought that up because I run over this with clients a lot, and I'm sure you do as well, where it's figuring out what the payoff is. And I was just talking to another client about this, talking about sleep and her digestion, and she gets up most mornings and does a Peloton ride. And I said, the payoff that you're getting for that Peloton ride actually isn't giving you as much benefit as you think as it actually would if you skipped that Peloton ride and got the adequate sleep that you needed to be able to go on with your day. And the same holds true exactly with your studying example of you likely would have performed better if you would have just gotten the sleep instead of trying to stay up late and study. And I think that's a really, really important point to make for anyone listening who might think, oh, I'm just going to grab some caffeine or I'm going to stay up a little bit later and I'll get caffeine in the morning where it's likely going to be better for you to really prioritize that sleep for your cognitive function and then still use a little bit of caffeine in the morning to then get that extra boost. And that's the correct way to utilize it to really get the best bang for your buck. Absolutely. The last benefit that we're going to speak on here is the one that we are all benefiting the most within our our health and fitness journey uh, as a whole. It's going to improve overall athletic performance and endurance. With this, caffeine is going to stimulate the release of adrenaline, which is going to increase heart rate, increase blood flow, and oxygen delivery to the muscles, which is all things that we would love to have while we're training. And with that being the case, this is going to improve overall performance during endurance-based exercises such as running, cycling, and swimming, but it is going to also positively impact your strength output um, within resistance training and those different factors. So in a pre-workout, this is one of those ingredients that's like, yep, you should have this in there provided that you're not training super late into the evening or anything of that nature, but pre-workout, caffeine is going to be a useful tool for you. And again, we're going to get into the dosages that are most specific to you as the individual that will be the best to reap these benefits rather than it just being like 400 milligrams, I'm getting tons of caffeine, I'm gonna get tons of benefit. That's not how that works. So one thing that research has also shown is that if you take a couple of days off of the caffeine prior to a competition and then consume that quality uh, caffeine that we're speaking about, you're going to reap the greatest maximum benefit from that caffeine you're ingesting, which makes sense, right? Um, When we talk about having, and we'll speak on this here shortly, in terms of getting to a place where your tolerance has has gotten too high and you're needing to decrease, just a few days without the caffeine resensitizes you well. And so with this being shown through research, it makes total sense that just 48 to 72 hours without any caffeine really allows for you to maximize the benefits that you're experiencing from that caffeine right before the competitive bout that you're about to have. Yeah. And to speak a little bit more when it comes to resistance training, because you had mentioned when it came to those endurance activities and what caffeine can do here. So caffeine can reduce fatigue during resistance exercise, which can allow you to train harder and longer, which we love to be able to do. And also that caffeine and taking caffeine can decrease the rate of perceived exertion uh, when you're training. So if you're looking at an RPE, if you have some caffeine beforehand, then that can decrease what you are perceiving that to be. So before caffeine, you might have said that was a nine, but maybe after caffeine, it's a seven or an eight. And then um, it also is going to onset the fatigue um, of any kind of DOMS. It's going to be able to offset some of that, uh, as well as it is going to be beneficial um, when it comes to being able to have greater gains in muscle size because you're going to be able to have a better power output for trained athletes. Now, there was a lot to say that when it comes to a trained versus untrained athlete, that a trained athlete saw more benefits with caffeine than an untrained trained athlete, which makes sense when you really think about it because it comes down to how well you can perform and how efficient you can get within training. And so it makes sense that someone who can train and be more efficient within training would reap more benefits by taking that caffeine. I have another interesting tidbit for you. All right. It's about the Pope. No, it's actually about the Olympics. And also with this one, I did not fact check again. I found it, found it interesting, put it in the notes. <laughs> in the 2004 Olympics, Greek weightlifter, I'm not even going to try to say his first name, 
his last name is Samponis, was stripped of his bronze medal after testing positive for caffeine. While caffeine is not considered a banned substance by the World Anti-Doping Agency, athletes are only allowed to consume a certain amount before competitions. Now, what is that certain amount? That's what I was how just about they, to ask. How are they testing for this? What is the, are they watching everyone right before they go on? Are they having a, a urinalysis right before they go and compete? I'm confused. I bet it's somewhat like a uh, natural bodybuilding competitions where they test you if you win to see if you have anything. And I believe it's the same with weightlifting competitions that are uh, monitored for that and have certain regulations that it's if you do win, then you are tested afterwards to see if that win holds. Maybe. I mean. But I'm very intrigued as to what that caffeine limit is. Yeah. I would love to know the actual number there. So if any of you listening have that total allotment of caffeine that people are able to consume, LMK. <laughs> When for your next time at the Olympics yes. to make sure you don't get a medal stripped from you at the when's the next Olympics 2024 I couldn't tell you at the next Olympics 2024 <laughs> I will be there and you have to let me know how much caffeine I can consume. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. Now, with this caffeine, there are going to be some shortcomings. I know we just gave you a multitude of benefits and you're probably at the point where it's like, I just want to consume all the caffeine in the world. Well, there are going to be some shortcomings. Sue, what are some of the shortcomings that may come about with caffeine use? Well, when it comes to caffeine, it is going to affect each person differently. So you need to be able to take that into consideration. And so it can cause side effects like increased heart rate, anxiety, insomnia. And so it's really going to be something that you have to take inventory of how you personally respond to it and what place it holds in your day to day as a whole. A few of the other things that you can feel are anxiety, and then also you can have digestive issues. I know that we just did our digestion starter pack episodes, um, and acid reflux, and this is something I talk about with clients a lot. If they are experiencing acid reflux, is to take a look at their caffeine consumption um, and see if that might be playing a role there. Right, and I think that in excessive caffeine consumption, when we talk about excessive, we're talking high quantities, probably plus 800 milligrams a day or higher, which is honestly not as hard as you may think to get to, because like we just talked about at the beginning, where you have a venti coffee in the morning per se at 475 milligrams, then you go and have a pre-workout at two or three o'clock for your workout, you're already at 875 between those two products. And you're like, well, I only had two drinks. Well, in reality, it's going to be quantity based or quantity is the problem there. And so when we talk about excessive use, we can also run into more serious health issues such as high blood pressure, heart palpitations, and even in a very extreme cases, see cardiac arrest be involved with this. I think there's a multitude of other factors that have to be aligned for this to be the outcome, but I thought it was necessary for us to note just to make sure that we're all encompassing here as we talk through some of the literature. Yeah. What would you say is the most caffeine you've probably ingested in a day or for regularly for a period of time? Well, this is going to expose me. Um, I think that at a period of my life, especially in college, I would say regularly consuming like 800 or 900 milligrams on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I'm not proud to say that, but I think that that was probably that period of my life where I was doing all the things when I was uh, playing. Well, even after that, I would probably say that my schedule was crazier after I finished playing college baseball. So it was a situation where I was working roughly 40 hours at the vitamin shop. I was taking 16 to 18 credit hours at, in college. And then I also was doing my, you know, my training and, and those different factors. It was long days as well as getting physique development on its feet. So I was having maybe 15 or 20 clients at that time. So 15 to 20 clients, 40 hours at a day job and then 16 to 18 credit hours of class. There was not a free moment in my day. I can assure you there was months there where I did not speak to another human really. <laughs> I literally just went from task to task to task and would fall asleep generally at my desk every night. 
And I, in that old apartment there, my bed and my desk were steps apart. Truly. <laughs> and there would be nights where I would fall asleep at that desk. There'd be nights where I would fall asleep like in between the bed and the desk because I was like, I'll just take a small nap here. If I get up on the bed, I'm going to go to sleep, <laughs> but I can take a quick nap just laying on the floor and I would never take a quick nap. I'd be asleep the whole night and wake up so sore from sleeping on basically concrete. That apartment had the thinnest layer of- Very thin carpet. Carpet. I can't even, I wouldn't even call it carpet. It was, I'm sure that someone listening can relate to this in the sense that their college apartment was like just a piece of fuzz (laughs) over the concrete that they said was carpet. And that was my situation. So in that period of time, probably 800 to 900 milligrams on a day-to-day basis. What you about said you? you didn't have time, but you had time to go get some coffee. <laughs> I, I would say it was more energy drinks at that time. Yeah. You know, you really were that, that crazy busy because you even had told me you might not be able to to talk to me because you didn't have the time in a day. Uh, But in 2020 was probably the worst. Um, I was the worst offender and I was getting like 800 milligrams to a gram of caffeine a day. And that was very normal. And it was something that I would have like a full, full (laughs) caffeinated coffee in the morning and then even have another full one in the afternoon. And that was very normal. Whereas now I start the day with decaf and then I have normally one cup, maybe two of coffee and that's it. And I'm normally done with my coffee by 10 a.m. And it's not even a thought to have any other caffeine throughout the day. So it's it's quite wild to take a look at that and see how normalized that was and how easy it was to get to that 800 or 1,000 milligrams. Just so, so easy. And you become very dependent on it. Yes. And that is another shortcoming of caffeine use. So you can have caffeine dependency as well as experience withdrawal. Now, with the withdrawal, you're going to have symptoms such as headache and fatigue and greater irritability. I know that some individuals that come to mind, I'm not going to you know bring up anyone's name and none of the people that I'm thinking about are actually in this room right now, that when they don't get their coffee at a specific time, at a specific quantity, they're very frustrated. They're very irritable, and it is not a fun time to be around them at that point. They thrive off of a specific quantity of caffeine and those different factors. And so this is what we would like to call caffeine dependency. (laughs) (laughs) And if that person was to discontinue use of that caffeine, they would be extremely irritable. They would find themselves probably having a pretty strong headache. But if they were able to fight through for roughly two to four days, three to five days, something in that realm, they would probably get to a place where they're more receptive to the caffeine and getting greater benefit by just taking those small breaks. So if it is possible, I always encourage for individuals to take periods of time off of caffeine. I know that there is many situations and I fall into this category as well of like, we live in a society that is very go, go, go. And it's work every day. It's hustle culture is very popularized, if you will, especially in the entrepreneur space. And so you find yourself in a situation where it's like, oh my gosh, take a week off of caffeine. I'd rather die because (laughs) I will not get near as many things done. And I have to get maximal things done every single day for my business to thrive. And I'm sure that some of you listening are like, yep, same, bro. I'm (laughs) definitely not doing that. And I can assure you, as someone who has thought that way, can still think that way at times, I've taken periods of time away from caffeine, five to seven days, and it is such a massive benefit if you're feeling as though that you're drinking that caffeine and the only thing that's spiking is your anxiety. And you're like, bro, I need this to give me energy and alertness and all the benefits that we just talked about. I need that. And all I'm getting is the anxiety and I still feel drowsy. That's probably a time for you to be like, bro, step back and have a little bit of time away from it so that you can actually have the benefit that you're seeking. Yeah. Or you're realizing that your normal amount, let's say you normally have one cup of coffee a day and you're needing two, three, four to get the same effect or even lesser of that effect, then that's a really great time to go ahead and take a little bit of a break. And that's exactly, it's just a small break being able to come back into it. You'll resensitize yourself overall. And some things that you can do if you are having those withdrawal 
all symptoms is to first just gradually reduce it instead of going cold turkey. You can definitely go cold turkey and that's going to be a great option, but gradually reducing it if that's going to work best for you because that's going to minimize those withdrawal symptoms. And an easy way to do this if you are still wanting to consume the same volume of coffee is just to cut your coffee with decaf coffee. So you're making it half calf. So that's going to help with minimizing that amount of caffeine in place or just having decaf in place, which is a huge reason I started to drink decaf was not only something that we're going to mention later when it comes to timing and utilization of caffeine, but also I enjoyed the taste and the routine of coffee much like so much more than just the caffeine. I enjoy the caffeine aspect, of course, but it was the taste and the routine of coffee itself. And once I realized that, I was able to really take a step back from just consuming as much caffeine and just take the decaf option, which I did used to be a hater of decaf because I thought to be a lover of coffee, you had to hate decaf. But I have since changed my mind, as we can all change our minds. Um, Another thing that can help with withdrawal symptoms is being able to get in enough water, um, and that can relieve symptoms like the headaches happening. And just a quick sidestep there, since coffee can work as a diuretic here, um, if you have coffee in general, making sure you have water before or alongside it and being able to put in like a pinch of salt or being able to drink some electrolytes alongside it is really going to freaking help. And the reason for this is because it causes us to lose fluid and along with that fluid, so that diuretic effect, excrete sodium because of the processes with the kidneys. So just being able to replenish some of that sodium with some salt water uh, or some electrolytes is gonna go a long way. Um, And then a few other things that you can do to help with withdrawal symptoms is being able to exercise and move your body because that's gonna bring those endorphins into play which can improve your mood and reduce anxiety, and then making sure that you're getting enough sleep is going to help as well. I appreciate you going into the different components of how to address some of those withdrawal symptoms and um, navigating through that. Now, another shortcoming within caffeine consumption is that it is going to interact with medications. And within medications, I think that the biggest thing is that if you are consistently consuming caffeine, and you're prescribed a new medication from your physician, it is in your best interest to speak with them on how does caffeine interact with this medication? Does it have any interactions? And moving forward from there, I think that it's just an easy question. Your physician will certainly have the knowledge to be able to provide with you that it is or is not um, interacting with the medication. Now, one type of medication that is is commonly going to interact or, or have some impact from caffeine is going to be thyroid medication. And I know that you've experienced this with some clients. So what are some of the things that you see there? It is 100% one of the things I see the most when it comes to medication, but it is very important to check anything, whether it be antibiotics, antidepressants, blood thinners, anything like that. So going into thyroid medication, even just having sips of coffee can affect how your thyroid medication is going to be absorbed by the body. And what some studies have found is that coffee reduced the body's absorption by about 30%. So it is very much so recommended that you wait at least one hour between drinking coffee and taking your thyroid medication. And the reason for this when we're looking at the absorption is it's going to increase the speed in which the drug passes through the intestines because caffeine is a stimulant and so it can increase the gut motility, meaning that the muscle contractions that move food through the digestive tract. So caffeine also has a mild laxative effect and that increases the amount of fluid in stools. So both of these things together can cause your thyroid medication to move through the intestines too quickly before it has a chance to be absorbed. So it is extremely important to know about your medications and what those different effects or what it looks like for interactions when it comes to your medications and anything else you might be having, but specifically things that you do regularly, like consuming caffeine. 
Moving on to the last shortcoming that we are going to go over here is going to be talking about caffeine in pregnancy. I know that when it comes to pregnancy, there are a ton of things that are considered off limits. And I used to think that caffeine was completely supposed to be off limits if you were pregnant. But it is very important to note here that caffeine consumption during pregnancy, while it can be risky, it is shown that pregnant women, as long as they limit their caffeine consumption to no more than 200 milligrams per day that they should be in a solid spot to move forward. But again, you're going to want to ask your doctor specifically and have that conversation because you might have other risk factors that might make it that having that caffeine in place might not be good for you personally. So on average, 200 milligrams and below is good for pregnant women, but you definitely want to discuss that and your plan with your doctor. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Now, Alex, you've been talking about the ideal amount of caffeine to have in place to get the benefits that we've mentioned. Is 200 milligrams going to help in getting those benefits or is it at a different amount? 200 milligrams may work. Um, this is actually going to be dependent on your body weight. And within this, we're going to have a one to three milligram of caffeine per kilogram of body weight that will be the dosage that will have the positive benefit without making us feel anxious or overwhelmed. This is in a single serving as a tolerable dose. So we're not talking about having coffee in the morning and then coffee in the evening. This is about sitting down with your beautiful wife, having breakfast, and how much caffeine are we consuming at that moment to benefit us as we go into the workday. That's what we're talking about right now. So one to three milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight is what we're looking at. I'm going to go ahead and give you guys an example so that we can make this more applicable to you. So let's say that you weigh 140 pounds. That is 63.5 kilograms. Just take your body mass in pounds and then divide that by 2.2 and that will give you your weight in kilograms. A tolerable dose of caffeine for an individual who weighs 140 pounds is going to be 60 to 190 milligrams for them to have the positive benefit from caffeine. And so that 200 milligram Alani New Energy drink may get a little jitter and a little bit of anxiousness accompanied with some of those benefits that you're experiencing. If you are someone who does not consistently consume caffeine, I would recommend starting on the lower side of this at that one milligram per kilogram of body mass to see the benefit. I would certainly would not recommend starting with the three milligrams per kilogram of body weight if you're not consistently consuming caffeine. Or you may be the individual who does consistently consume caffeine and you're realizing, oh man, I am well above <laughs> what this recommended dosage is. The range of tolerance is going to be in place for two reasons. One of them is that you have a pre-existing disposition within your genetics, your nervous system, and the stress that you are currently experiencing. Now, this is something that I do want to spend some time speaking about because this applies so heavily and I see it so much in my own life when I have poor sleep or I have greater stress from a personal life, from a work perspective, caffeine hits different. I can have the same quantity of caffeine on those days and depending on those different variables definitely impacts me differently. And when we're on vacation per se, it impacts me significantly differently because I can have a ton of delicious coffee and not really feel anxious at all. It just is easy to drink, easy to sit around and enjoy. And I don't really get any jittery feeling because I'm, I'm not anxious. I'm not, uh, my stress is extremely low and those different factors. And so the environment that we're in and, and the impact of the individuals that we're around and those different factors is going to impact how this caffeine is going to be tolerated. Keep that in mind. The other reason is caffeine adaptation. If you drink the caffeine within the range that we just discussed, 
and it is raising your heart rate and increasing alertness and you feel anxious, that probably means that you're not caffeine adapt. If you are consuming in the range that we just spoke about and you are getting the benefits of the increased alertness and um, energy coming up and those different factors and you're not feeling anxious, that means that you are caffeine adapt, which is a, a good thing. And if you are in the category of not being caffeine adapt, I would encourage, again, to be on that lower side of the reference range that we spoke about. And so that is going to outline the quantity of caffeine. After listening to that, do you feel as though that you're drinking too much caffeine for your body mass, or do you think that you fall into that range? I definitely think I'm right in that range because, like I said, I'm really only having one cup of caffeinated coffee, sometimes two. And with Nespresso, I've looked this up a number of times. I do think it's odd that they don't just put per the pods that you're having exactly how much caffeine is on it on the site. And it just comes up and says that the average is around 65 milligrams per pod. But there are ones that are double espresso. There's larger uh, cups of coffee. So I would say that I'm likely at 150 or lower. I'm in the same boat. I would say with my body mass being at 215 pounds, that puts me right under 100 kilograms. Thus, I could consume all the way up to 300 milligrams on a day-to-day basis on a single sitting, but I'm not doing that. I'm having significantly less. I would say between like a 90 and 150 on a day-to-day basis is where I am. So I feel great about myself that I'm in that range. As I've already alluded to multiple times throughout this episode, there have been many phases of my life that that is not the case. Yes. But, you know, we waited until we were in that place (laughs) so we could feel good about ourselves to to go over this. (laughs) Now that we have an understanding of the quantity that we should consume, there is some beauty within the timing in which we are consuming caffeine. Do you want to give the listeners a little bit of insight on that? The timing can be so powerful when it comes to caffeine, and there's a lot to be said about delaying caffeine when you first wake up. And I know some of you do not want to hear that at all because you might be going to sleep dreaming about that coffee in the morning, but it can be really beneficial to delay caffeine 90 to 120 minutes after waking. So that's going to be an hour and a half to two hours after waking. And if you end up taking that caffeine within that 30 to 60 minutes of waking, you may experience having a 2 p.m. crash. And the reason for this is going to be because you're not completely clearing that adenosine that we talked about earlier. So if you're able to wait a little bit longer and possibly be able to get outside into some sunlight or maybe do a little bit of exercise for as little as five to 10 minutes, that can allow you to have a strong cortisol spike. And that cortisol spike can increase your mood, alertness, and can clear clear out any of that residual adenosine and then be able to put you in a spot that that coffee is going to have the best benefit and, again, that best bang for your buck as you are drinking it. So if you are experiencing that 2 p.m. crash, you could end up reaching for some more caffeine, which starts a very vicious cycle of you have that caffeine too late in the day, and then it ends up impeding your sleep quality and potential quantity as well. And within that 2 p.m. crash, if you're having caffeine, then that's going to be pretty close to your bedtime. Now, I know you guys aren't going to bed at 3 or 4 p.m., but caffeine has a quarter life of about 12 hours. So if you have coffee at 8 a.m., about 25% of that caffeine action will still be present at 8 p.m. that night. This is why I often recommend to clients to ensure that we are getting the major bolus of our caffeine before noon each day. Now, I understand that individuals have a full day of work and they're getting off work at 5 p.m. and they're going to the gym right after work and it's been a long day. In that context, do your best to minimize the amount of caffeine that you're consuming. As we talked about within those pre-workouts, it's probably not in your best interest to have a 300 or 400 milligram caffeine source around 6 p.m. every night. Now, I do know individuals that Allegedly, they don't experience any impeding on their sleep, but I would imagine that if they were to have a night of sleep where they are not consuming that caffeine that late into the evening, that they would experience better sleep 
without it. So that's one thing to keep in mind as you are going through your day and, and trying to schedule out your caffeine consumption as a whole. Now, one thing that I do personally like, and, and one thing that I practice as a whole is going to be consuming caffeine on an empty stomach. And I know that some individuals in the gut health space are shaking their head right now <laughs> and they're so angry and they want to come through the speakers right now and punch me in the face. And that's okay. But when ingesting caffeine on an empty stomach, you are going to increase the benefit or the uh, action of that caffeine when consuming it. And so if you are someone who is consistently consuming caffeine, you digest it well, and those different aspects, I find it to be very beneficial. If it is causing any uh, GI distress as a whole, pairing it with those electrolytes, having adequate water in place is a huge help there. So keeping that in mind, but I am someone who I do like that pick me up that's really strong on an empty stomach relative to having it with a, a large bolus of food or what have you. Yeah, because you can get away with just drinking less caffeine by having it on an empty stomach. So it's a little hack there. And if you are experiencing some of those jitters, there is a tool that we can utilize called theanine. If you are a consistent use, or user, if you're a consistent listener to the podcast, we have talked about theanine many, many a times. I find it to be probably one of my favorite supplements as a whole, as it is going to offset a lot of those jittery feelings that you would experience, 100 to 200 milligrams. A one-to-one -one ratio of the total caffeine relative to the theanine that you're consuming is probably a good place. I actually like it to be a two-to-one ratio. So if I'm having 200 milligrams of caffeine, I will have 100 milligrams of theanine, and I find that to be the sweet spot as it decreases that jittery feeling and allows for me to have a little bit of a smoother focus as a whole alongside the benefits that I'm receiving from the caffeine. So when we look at the theanine consumption, you may see this within energy drinks. You may see this when, within pre-workouts. I know that Legion's pre-workout has a one-to-one -one ratio within their caffeine to theanine, correct? Yeah. And even coffee manufacturers are putting theanine like in the beans to be able to help offset some of that anxiousness or that excitatory feeling because that theanine is going to kind of even that out overall. It's not going to cancel out the energy. It's not going to necessarily make you sleepy unless you're consuming upwards of a thousand milligrams a day of theanine. But just being able to have that alongside caffeine, if you are experiencing those jitters, can really really help even out that feeling overall. Yes. And clients who have overconsumed, that's the first thing that I would tell them to reach for because it can bring down that jittery or, or anxious or overwhelming feeling and kind of bring you back down to a baseline, which is a, a big help. But it does not mitigate the metabolization of that caffeine that we just talked about within the half-life and the quarter-life and those different factors. It's still probably going to be a struggle for you to go to sleep, but at least you'll be more calm. Yes. <laughs> it's a temporary Band-Aid solution, but it is not something that you should use chronically of, I'm just going to overconsume and take theanine and I'm going to be all good to go. So coming back to that afternoon caffeine consumption and impeding on your overall sleep, there's a book called Why We Sleep. And this is written by Dr. Matt Walker, who is an expert sleep researcher. And in that book, he talks about how that quarter life of caffeine is going to impact you. So if you're consuming caffeine at noon, let's say uh, 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams at noon, we'll say 200 milligrams, with that consumption, 25% of that is still bioactive at midnight, which will affect the early hours of your sleep, the amount of slow wave sleep, which will also disrupt the amount of rapid eye movement or REM sleep that you're experiencing. And that will disrupt your emotional processing during the following day, as well as when my REM sleep is down on my aura ring, that is one of the things that I can definitely feel. If my deep sleep and my REM sleep are down, it's no bueno for me, no bueno for me and just the quality of like my memory and those different factors. So getting the most REM and deep sleep that I possibly can get is a huge benefit. And I allow for myself to be set up to have the greatest quantity of both of those by having all of my caffeine prior to noon. I even like to really push it to 11 in the morning um, to allow for myself to have the best sleep possible.
And we know that that's not realistic for everyone. And if you are a mom and you are just going all day showing up for other people, or maybe you're a nurse and you work different shift hours, also your your timing is going to be different than the, quote, average person's day timing. Uh, so occasionally, if you have caffeine later in the day, is it going to be the end of the world? No. But if you can stop caffeine within 12 hours, that's going to be best. If you can't do within 12, do within 10. And if you can't do within 10, do within eight. But really try not to have caffeine within eight hours of you going to sleep. Because like Alex talked about, it is going to affect that slow wave sleep. And slow wave sleep is actually going to be that deep sleep and that's associated with mundane dreams. So you might think, oh, it's really not that important. But it's also associated with growth hormone release, which is important for protein synthesis, repair of all bodily tissues and metabolism, and critically attached to your immune system's ability to clear out bacteria and viruses. So it is extremely important and not mundane at all to be able to get that. So even if you're someone who's like, I can drink an espresso and just go straight to sleep, you might be able to sleep and you might be thinking that you are getting good quality sleep, but it is going to disrupt that deep sleep, that slow wave sleep, and that is going to impair you moving forward. That was a lot of information on caffeine, but if you had to tell someone, hey, here is what I want you to really drive home from this to take home. What would be your main take home? Do your best to delay your caffeine consumption. At least try to get to the hour marker. I know we said 90 to 120 minutes, but if you can get to an hour, I think that that's a good start because I think that many individuals are waking up rolling over, getting to the kitchen, and then immediately starting that coffee. And that's the first thing that touches their lips and they start their day. So they're having within five to 10 minutes type situation. So 60 minutes would be a big upgrade. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is trying to limit your caffeine consumption to your absolute best ability before noon every day. If you can get the greater bolus or all of your caffeine consumption before noon, I think that that's going to allow for you to have better sleep, thus not having the need to have as much caffeine if you're having better sleep as a whole, because a big part of why many people overconsume caffeine is because their sleep is not good. Thus, having the quality sleep is going to be a better option. What is the one take home for you? Caffeine is a tool and you want to use it to get the most bang for its buck. And as we've mentioned, we abused caffeine and it was a an aspect that I didn't understand how it could be used to really benefit my life. And now I feel like I use it appropriately and I don't abuse it or overuse it. And I'm not using it as a Band-Aid for other issues in my life. And so honestly, my main advice for you is to fix the other shit and pay attention. If your sleep sucks, go listen to our sleep podcast and fix your sleep and not using caffeine as that band-aid and just using it so haphazardly without understanding how to use it. Because while it is something that most adults use, and like I said, 90% of adults are using it every single day, most of them don't know how to use it correctly or how it can feel when used correctly in your life. So really my main advice is fix the other shit and use caffeine to help help you, but not using it in a way that is really blunting a lot of other aspects. I will add that hydration is a big part here as well. Uh, if individuals are just constantly consuming energy drinks, coffee, and going back and forth without having any water in between, which is way more common than I would have ever imagined as I see other people in life as well as working with clients and those different factors. So hydration is huge. That wraps it up for us today. Caffeine may be a small molecule but it has had a big impact on our lives and culture throughout history. From its ancient origins to its modern day uses, caffeine is a fascinating subject that we just recorded a very long podcast on <laughs> and hope you guys got a lot out of it. If you guys are not subscribed to the YouTube channel or subscribe to the podcast, please do so now. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you thought of this episode and we'll catch you in the next one.